Last semester in my graduate studies, I took a course called Spirituality Throughout the Ages. And this semester, I'm taking a course called Matristics, which is a wonderful flip on the word patristics, or the church fathers. In this case, I'm studying the church mothers. Much of their writings uh, were not preserved because they were women. And women's voices historically in the church have not always counted in the same way that men's voices have. But I'm studying with probably one of the top three uh, feminist theologians in the world, and it's really interesting to be going through history through her eyes. And one of the things out of all of that I would share with you today is that the history of Christianity is filled with people looking for ways to live out the resurrection life and light. Under diverse cultural and socioeconomic and ultimately political circumstances, sometimes during even great oppression or persecution, often at times of great neglect or abuse. And we look at these movements, and you may know of some of them from having read Great Controversy. You may know of some of them from studying history yourself. But these movements, ascetic movements, and where people removed themselves from society largely, or so it would appear, and set up religious communities, convents, etc., or developed orders like the Benedictine or Dominican orders, or these kinds of things out of Catholicism that seem very strange to us now, uh, the, these movements, really not so strange. What they were looking at was a way to, yes, isolate themselves in a way so that they could A, be dedicated to the study of Word of God, that they could experience and practice the disciplines of Christianity, including extended periods of silence and isolation. They were almost uniformly um, engaged in raising their own food, producing their own crops in the area around uh, their convents and territories. Some of the desert fathers uh, would not have had much in the way of gardening resources, survived very minimally, often at the goodwill of, of others and the patronage of others, but developed incredible wisdom and sayings and wrote many things that have been preserved for us in Christendom, things that have influenced our own founders and our own faith over time. Why do I bring all this up? I bring this up because how we live in light of the resurrection matters. And for these folks, they wanted to avoid sin and temptation as much as possible. They wanted to concentrate their lives on productivity and spiritual things. They wanted, in many cases, not all, in many cases, there was an incredible service component to what they were doing. They ministered to people in the area, whether it be the poor or whether they tutored. In many places where vows of poverty were not so strongly taken, they basically established universities that predate the university system. They had massive libraries and people could come and learn. And interestingly enough, even some girls were taught to read who ended up writing as well. Amazing things done by men and women who were seeking to live out resurrection community and life based in part on what we just read this morning. So that's our theme for the last week and, and maybe a week or two to come. We're going to be thinking about, as a community, our journey, our life with God, this year with God and beyond, and how it is that we want to live in light of the resurrection. Because I think without some deliberate and very careful thinking, choosing, planning, acting, we will default, live like everybody else around us. That's what we're used to. Culture is a powerful force. And it's not that I'm advocating uh, that we take the extremes of some of the, the early movements of asceticism and monasticism but I am suggesting that we want to give some thought as a community to how we want to reflect resurrection light and life as we think about uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So our texts this morning are varied, and I'm going to start actually uh, with the gospel reading and go backwards. John 20, 
was just read to us, 19 to 31. Now notice where the disciples are. They're together behind locked doors, fearful, mostly of the Jewish leaders. The doors are locked, and yet Jesus, now in his glorified body, appears among them as a ghost. I find this rich and interesting because earlier in the gospel, we find Jesus walking on the water, and the disciples are sure they're seeing a ghost. Only he's in his physical body. They're terrified of it. And now, in his glorified body, locked doors don't seem to mean anything to him. He appears among them and he says, don't be afraid. Have you heard that message before? It was said by angels as they announced his birth. It's in fact, it's said almost every time an angel appears. He uses the term, peace be with you, shalom. After he said this, he showed his hands to them because they must have been wondering, and, and who are you? And Jesus said again, Peace be with you. Now, the next part is so incredibly rich. Let's just take a moment to, to, to let it sink in. May my peace be with you, Jesus says. And then he goes on to say this. The Father sent me into your midst. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah, beautiful passage now, John 20, God sent me, the Father sent me into the world to be with you. And now I am going to send you to be in the world for me. The locked doors are going to have to open up. The cloister is going to have to end. This time of fear is going to have to give way to a time of courage. But he doesn't leave them powerless. Listen to what he does. And with that, he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, if I were thinking as a child, I might say, I hope he had had a cert before he did that. <laughs> but I think what we have reference to here is something much deeper than breath. You see, there was a time in the garden not so long before where Christ knelt over a formed human being made in dirt, the scripture says, and breathed into him, breathed on him. Scripture records that that clay man became a living being. God brought animation, life, the spark of life, Cognition, everything that goes with being a human being, God brought that in breath to the man. He took the spirit of life that is his and placed it within us. And so he breathes on these disciples as if making them anew. They are dead in their fears. They are dead in their sins. They are dead in their uh, hopes, because without a risen Lord, what point is there? Paul makes that statement. And Jesus breathes on them and brings them to spiritual life in this moment. Receive the Holy Spirit, he says. This was the one he had promised. This was the advocate that he had promised, the counselor. And then he goes on to make an incredible statement. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We have to take that in context, though, right? The larger context means if you don't forgive someone who's harmed you, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. That's the context. But Jesus passes on to his disciples life, mission, and authority. That is what living resurrection looks like. We embrace God's life, we live out a mission to the world, and we do it with God's authority. But there was one who doubted. Now, I think you're doing really good if just one in 12 are doubting. 
really good. I tend to be on the um, questioning side of things sometimes. So I don't know if I would have been Thomas or not, but I tend to be one of these kind of people that wants to ask the hard question. And I am convinced that doubting is essential to faith. I am convinced that questions are essential if we're ever to get to some kind of answer. The opposite of hate is not love. It's The opposite of love is not hate, rather. It's apathy. It's apathy. And when we're apathetic about our spiritual selves and lives, when we have no questions, no engagement to bring, what have we, what have we really got? Faith requires building, and building requires a growth, and a growth requires development and understanding, and this takes place through doubt and question. So I am a doubter, and I am a believer, and in between I have to say, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Thomas was a bit of a cynic. Yeah, fat chance, he says until I actually put my finger in the nail holes in his hands and his feet and shove my fist into his side, I think I'm going gonna, think I'm gonna to hold the skepticism. You can hear him say it, can't you? He's almost jeering those who would believe, daring them to believe in spite of the lack of physical evidence. And it says a week later the disciples were in the house again and the doors were still locked still living there in fear, still not sure. And Jesus came and stood among them again. The door wasn't a barrier. And he said, Shalom, peace be with you. Peace. We'll come back to that. Then he said to Thomas, as if he had been listening the whole time, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Now, Thomas, you've seen. Stop doubting and believe. Part of our task post-resurrection, part of our task in the life we live in the here and now is to put aside our disbelief at some point, unlock our doors and believe. To receive the peace that God wants to give us and the empowerment. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And it was a powerful confession. But Jesus did have to say, you know, you made that confession on hard evidence. Blessed are those who don't see and still believe. That's you. That's me. We look for traces of God's hands. We look for patterns of God's movement. We look for evidences of his working and changing and moving in our lives. And sometimes we struggle with it. Thomas had Christ the risen before him and could place his finger in his hand and his fist in his side. He could see the scars, the holes. my Lord and my God. Jesus performed other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded. But this testimony is written that you might believe he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by that believing you may have life in his name. Post-resurrection means that we accept the breath of God into our lives. We come alive and accept the commission that he's given us and the empowerment that goes with that commission. It means that we've asked our questions, we've expressed our doubts, and we have placed our finger in the nail holes and our hand in the side, and we have said, my Lord and my God, and he has said, now that you believe, don't give up your belief. All this is done so that you might believe. And in believing, what comes to believers? Life. 
life. For God, say it with me, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, what? Believeth on him should have life. That's right. Life comes through belief. It's not neutral. To say I believe in something means that that something comes with life. Oftentimes we believe in it, things that have no, no purpose in believing in, but that's another sermon. I come now to 1 John, same author, different set of letters, books, a little bit more esoteric passage, but I want, I want to uh, just touch on this briefly. It was read for us, that which we've heard from the beginning, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched. You hear John making the reference back to what Thomas was doing. Out of our disbelief, he says, belief has taken hold. And we proclaim this regarding the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father as he has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So now we're tracking. We have the love of Christ and the Father that brings him to us in the first place. We have the peace that he commands and the life that he speaks into our lives. And now, out of all of this, out of faith and belief and hope, comes joy. I like being joyful. I really don't like, I, I've had long stretch now of not feeling very well. It's not a joyful place to be. It's possible to experience joy in the midst of that, but it's not a happy place to be. I like being in a happy place, in a joyful place. But whatever our circumstances, we can have joy in Christ. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and if we fellowship with him, we're walking in that light. And if we fellowship with one another in that light, his blood purifies us all. I'm kind of paraphrasing. If we claim to be without sin, and none of us do, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. The truth comes when we confess who we really are, and recognize who he really is, that he is faithful and we are not. That the truth is in him and we have no truth in us. That righteousness is his and unrighteousness is ours. But out of all of this, because we have Jesus, the apostle would that we would not sin, but notes quickly, in our sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Christ the righteous one. His is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So this passage reminds us of another way in which we live in light of the resurrection. Cognizant of our former state, lost in sin, aware of the grace and forgiveness that's come to us in Jesus Christ, and not presumptuous about that. Confessing, as we talked about a few weeks ago, our sins, and accepting that forgiveness, granting that to one another freely, and allowing those burdens to roll away, that our joy might be complete in Christ, and that our faith may be strengthened in community. Man, I am making great time. You are going to get to lunch here before you know it. <laughs> I'm, I'm blazing through these passages. You've never seen me go this fast. So stay with me a few more minutes. Psalm 133. Good stuff. The older I get, the more I appreciate birds, flowers, cool breezes, sunshine, and the Psalms. As a young man, blah, blah, blah. As a mature man, We'll use that term. <laughs> Almost mature. They're so beautiful. 
How good and pleasant, the psalmist says, it is when God's people live together in unity. Now, I don't think it's a stretch for us to relate the idea of being at peace to having unity. I don't think that's much of a stretch. I think there can be considerable peace out of living in unity. Listen to how he poetically describes this, the imagery. It's like precious oil, not common oil, precious oils poured on the head. Maybe they're medicinal, maybe they're fragrant. Running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, that must have been quite a beard. We do have a few bearded men today. I know there's a whole movement with beards. Have you seen all the young guys with beards out there? They're making fun of the rest of us saying that our testosterone isn't sufficient to grow our own beards. I seriously doubt that, but anyway, it's a movement. It's a beard thing. Running down Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. Sounds like a mess to me. Dry cleaning bill, maybe? I don't know. But the poetry is lovely. Here he is receiving this oil, fragrant, anointing, healing, and it's flowing down him. And then another metaphor, as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Sion, for the Lord there bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, and I hope you'll go with me one day, if you haven't been, we've, we've, we've taken a couple trips there, but I hope to do another one day. I don't know when, and I hope some of you will go with me on that too. If you go to Mount Hermon, which we will, you will see snow even in the summer on the peaks of Mount Hermon. It's a very tall mountain. And I don't know if the translation of dew could also mean snow or whether it just simply means the morning dew that comes up in areas where there's water because off of Mount Hermon, the frozen waters that flow off of that mountain make up a good part of the Jordan River. And those waters are cold. When they say the River Jordan is chilly and cold in the song, they aren't kidding. It is cold, even in summer. So those waters flow off the snow melt from Mount Hermon. It's really beautiful. And the dew rises there in the spring around the grasses at the base. And if you go up to the Temple Mount, Jerusalem's very dry. It's very arid around there. And I don't know how dry it was at the time of Christ or the time of the psalmist before that, but the imagery is of that incredible, uh, amazing source of water and green coming to Mount Zion. And it's two analogies of life. There's a sort of physical life of the mountain itself with its animals and its snow and its, its green and its color, its flowers. And there's life in Mount Zion because Mount Zion stands where the city of God is. And the city of God is Jerusalem. And according to some of the Mishrashem, not all, but some of the Mishrashem, the interpretation of the meaning of the word Jerusalem is city of peace. It's not the only meaning, but it's one of the meanings. So, the blessings of Mount Hermon are now falling onto Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the city of peace, where the Lord bestows his blessing, even life eternal, life evermore. We have in this the anointing, the blessing. And this is the anointing and blessing Jesus is giving through breath to his disciples. And we'll see it show up in our next text too. Anointing, blessing, peace, unity, Presence of the holy and righteous. Jerusalem is the place of peace. Presence of the holy one in the most holy of holies in the tabernacle there. All of it flows together as we think about what it means to be God's people in unity. Post-resurrection. Acts 4. Acts 4 is a tough text for those of us who live in and come from capitalist economies. But I want you to listen one more time. All the believers were in one heart and mind. What one single word would summarize that? Unity. 
We've been talking about that. Unity, peace. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they have. This would seem to imply that in the very early church, personal property ideals were eschewed. Now, what's interesting is I don't know that that was legally so because they took what they had and distributed it. So they still had it. They still owned it. And this was one of the things that the early church fathers and mothers really struggled with. If you build a monastery or a convent or a cloister somewhere or you have a retreat place, you have a dwelling, you own something. You have to have land to build upon and you own the structure that's built upon it. And then if you have a garden or a chicken coop or you have sheep that you milk and make cheese from or you have a vineyard that you make wine from or barley fields that you make beer from as the traditions have been in many of these European cloisters and monasteries, you have not only food that you own and crops that you own but sources of income. How do you live out poverty if you own all this stuff? And so they found ways around this by getting local nobility to sponsor them, owning the territory. They tried all sorts of things to really fulfill the poverty that they saw in Christ. I don't think the, the Acts New Testament Christians are quite dealing on that level. It's not a political thing that they're trying to do, although it has political consequences. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, continue to testify, that's part of the mission I spoke of, part of the commission I spoke of, part of unlocking the doors, part of telling a story, part of the courage and empowerment that we read of earlier. And when I speak of the resurrection in this passage, or it speaks of resurrection, we're speaking of life evermore, which ties into our psalm and ties into our other readings. And the life evermore is the life of Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Not just cast-offs. Now this week, if you follow Yahoo, you know, those sorts of, if you have email, you look online, there was a very interesting story about a CEO of a company called Gravity Payments. I am so sorry that this story is not framed in the Christian message. But I think if you listen, you'll see that this is somebody who lives the Acts message. Go ahead. I have a clip. What I wanted to announce today is um, effective immediately, we're going to put a scaled policy into place and we're going to have a minimum uh, $70,000 pay rate for everyone that works here. It's going to go into effect over the next three years or so. Uh, starting today, everybody in the company that makes under $50,000 a year is automatically going to make the greater of $50,000 a year or $3,000 more than you're making today. Or excuse me, five thousand dollars more than you're making today. So if you're making forty-eight, then you would go to fifty-three. If you're making forty-five or less, then you would go to fifty. And then starting December of next year, the minimum has to be sixty thousand dollars per year. So everyone that works here has to make at least sixty thousand dollars per year, um, and it's a requirement. You know, I'm putting on myself and on the company. And then starting December of the following year, it has to be seventy thousand, which I think is actually the really exciting number that I'd be happy about. <laughs> now there are risks associated with this and I'm sure there's lots of questions which we can get to and we have time for Q&A, but um, one of the things to try to offset that risk, you know, my pay is set based on market rates and kind of what it would take to replace me. And because of this growing inequality as a CEO, that amount is really, really high. I make, uh, you know, crazy, I, my compensation is really high. And so I'm actually taking my salary down to the minimum salary as well until our profit goes back up to where it is before we made this policy change. Now, I don't know about you, but that guy looks like Jesus to me. 
And at the very, at the very least, Santa Claus, right? I don't know if you could hear the track, but for people making 30 grand a year, they were now going to make 50, and then next year, 60, and the year after that, 70. Three-year phase-in so that no person in the company, none, no one, would make less than $70,000 a year. Now, I don't know if you're aware of what's happening with CEO compensation in this country, but there are CEOs who make over $100 million a year. Now, when you take that kind of compensation against the minimum wage set at $9 and some change an hour, what he's talking about in the growing inequalities are not just on a scale of degree, it's massive, massive inequality that's, that's developed in this world, in this country. I so wish that this clip had been framed in terms of this guy saying, because of Acts chapter 4, because I am a Christian, because I believe God calls me to walk differently, this is what I choose to do with my company. I wish he could have said that. What a powerful testimony it would be to the world. As it is, it's viral on Yahoo and YouTube. Everybody's watching this thinking, wow, that's incredible. What a great world it would be if more people did what he did. And that's at the heart of your message right here in Acts chapter 4. Many times we as Christians miss the obvious opportunity in front of us. I'm hitting that kind of hard, aren't I? I'll give you one more source. Any of you heard of TED Talks? You ever watch them? Okay, folks. I know everybody here has access to a computer. You can't tell me that in 2015 you don't have access to a computer. And if you don't, you have one at the library, okay? If you go and type in TED Talk and write down this name, Dan Ariely, Travis got me this source, he did a TED Talk on how equal do we want the world to be, and then he says you'd be surprised. And the essence of it was that when he surveyed people, he found out that they didn't want a flat world. They did not want a world in which everybody had the same thing. Nobody was pro-communism or socialism in that sense. But they did not want a world that reflected the gaps that we had now. They thought that greater resources should go to the poorest 20% and the next poorest 20% and the middle 20% than are even close to the actual numbers or percentages of wealth those people have. It was great power, with great power that the apostles testified to the resurrection of Jesus, and it was the power of the resurrection itself, it's a powerful story, but it's not as powerful a story without what they were doing. I want you to hear this this morning. The resurrection was made powerful in the words of hearers because the disciples had been made alive. They had been freed. They had been set free from locked doors and fear and moved into the place of mission and courage. Four, they weren't concerned about personal wealth. They were interested in a society in which everybody's needs were met. And when they did this, great power was attributed to it. The church grew like crazy. It grew like crazy. Living in the light of the resurrection requires more than attending an Easter service. It requires more than singing, Christ the Lord is risen today as much as I love that hymn. It requires more of us than saying, yeah, I, I believe. It requires us to give serious thought and consideration to what that breath of life looks like as it comes to us. Dear friends, we have received freely today. God has blessed us. Now I'm going to invite our deacons to collect our offering. Thank you. Amen.